Well, good evening. This is uh, Wednesday, October 14th, and this is an environmental studies alumni panel looking at the topic of shaping government and influencing policy. And we're featuring tonight three of our environmental studies alums, Tracy Stone Manning, Brian Farashi O'Malley, and Anna Peterson. And I'm going to pause the recording now until we're ready to get this started. Also, just be aware that we are recording this evening here and I want to and I'll encourage people to, to, to go ahead and mute yourself now you're welcome to keep your video screen on but go ahead and mute yourself for that um, I want to welcome everybody to tonight's event again this is an environmental studies alumni panel on Wednesday October 14th um, looking at the topic of shaping government and influencing policy and we've invited three of our wonderful environmental studies alums to join us here tonight Tracy Stone Manning Brian Farashi O'Malley and Anna Peterson whom I'll introduce in just a moment uh, here. Um, this panel came out as a result of our, our, our celebration of the 50th anniversary of the Environmental Studies Program. As many of you know, originally we had a large alumni reunion planned for the end of May to bring people back to Missoula and celebrate in person. And that alumni reunion was built around a series of alumni panels to address current topics. We're fortunate to have over a thousand alums of our graduate program and over 600 alums of our undergraduate program who are out doing some of the most important social and environmental work in the country around a, a series of different issues. And so we had built a reunion around a, a having our alums speak to these issues here. When we weren't able to hold that in person because of COVID, we moved to having an initial alumni panel uh, that, during that alumni uh, reunion time there, the last part of May. And then we decided we would actually try to keep some of these panels going throughout the rest of the year. So this is the first of what will be a series of different um, panels uh, to address these different issues. And we thought, given the current context of heading into the elections, that the topic about how we shape government and influence policy couldn't be more timely. Um, I will in introduce our three panelists now, and then I'm gonna pose uh, three uh, questions to just, just to get them started here, but then we'll encourage them to engage each other in conversation and also welcome other people to participate in the conversation once we get this underway here. So let me start with, um, I, I think our, our, our senior alumni member of the panel here is, is Tracy Stone Manning, uh, whose Tracy has been a vibrant presence in Montana for many years now here. She's currently the Associate Vice President for Public Lands at the National Wildlife Federation. But Tracy also served as the Chief of Staff for the Montana Governor Steve Bullock from 2014 to 2017. And prior to that was the Director of the Montana Department of Environmental Equality. She worked for John, Senator John Tester for six years in various capacities there. And then she has been the executive director of both the Clark Fork Coalition and Five Valleys um, Land Trust in the, uh, in the Missoula area there. So has an extensive history of working in both nonprofit sectors and in government sectors around key public issues. One of Tracy's key established uh, accomplishments while with the Clark Fork Coalition was spearheading the, the campaign to remove the Milltown Dam, which was a vibrant citizen campaign here in Missoula and across Western Montana, and which culminated in the 2008 removal of the dam and the restoration of the confluence of the Blackfoot Clark Fork rivers. Then we also have Brian Farashi O'Malley here, who's an environmental and natural resources attorney with Nossaman um, LLP, and whose practice spans both transactional work and litigation there. He regularly advises clients on renewable energy development and federal wildlife law issues. Prior to joining the Nossaman uh, law firm, Brian was an attorney with the U.S. Department of the Interior's Office of the Solicitor, uh, where he managed a nationwide docket of national resource damage cases under the Superfund CERCLA law and OPA. And before that, he was a contract a staff attorney at Greenpeace. I remember meeting Brian initially when right around the retirement of Tom Roy, and he was very involved in what was a delightful evening of celebrating and roasting uh, uh, Tom with the two Brian's putting together a lot of that work there. So I just barely overlap with Brian while we were in the program here. Um, but our third member is Anna Peterson, Anna, who I knew as Anna Swanson, Anna Swanson Peterson, who is the executive director of the Mountain Pact. Anna has worked professionally for 20 years with a range of constituency groups, nonprofits, small businesses, foundations, and large corporations on campaigns focused on corporate social responsibility, anti sweatshops, human rights immigration, refugee rights, public health, public lands, and climate change issues, to name just a few. Um, Anna runs her own communications agency called Conservation Communications, has worked on conservation campaigns in all states across the American West, as well as in Minnesota and Florida. 
And I had the very good fortune of, of overlapping with Anna while she was a graduate student here. And she and I were part of my very first uh, trip, trip taking uh, Montana students to Guatemala and to look at a variety of these issues there way back in around 2004. So that was a, quite a wonderful thing. So I want to say welcome to all of you here and to everybody who's joining us um, 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 via Zoom for this panel thing here. I want to start with a question which I'll, I'll pose to initially to Brian and then ask Anna and then Tracy to follow that. And that's just to tell us a little bit about your career after graduating from environmental studies. How did you get from EBST to where you are now? And was there anything about EBST that was important or helpful in that, in that movement? Brian, you want to start with that one? Sure, Dan. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. It's great to see so many faces, people we know and people we don't know. So um, I finished classes in the program in 2006. Technically, I graduated in 2008 because I took a little bit more time to finish my thesis. But um, I, I think I'm going to answer the question backwards. Uh, the interdisciplinary nature of EVST was really what helped set me forward on my path. You know, having experience in some science classes, having taken some environmental law classes, policy classes, uh, being able to combine all those things together. So um, when I left uh, Montana, I moved to DC and worked for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, uh, working on a bunch of their community-based uh, grant programs, doing habitat restoration and species reintroduction across the US. Uh, eventually moved back to Seattle area or moved to the Seattle area, worked for an environmental consulting firm doing similar work, again, community-based, small scale, um, projects and did that for a couple of years and decided I wanted to go uh, to law school that the sort of third leg, you know, I had a science background from before I came to EVST, I sort of worked in the policy arena and I needed to get that third sort of leg of the stool, which was uh, environmental law. So I went to University of Washington Law and knew I wanted to do environmental law and, you know, came out of there, worked for a small firm that just did environmental law here in Seattle, um, met my wife in law school. We moved to DC for her work, uh, and that was a different experience because uh, you know there's all sorts of you know ability to be close to the levers of power as they as they are. Um, so I initially uh, worked, I had a chance to work for Greenpeace as a contract staff attorney there, which was a really great experience to see what being at a at an international um, nonprofit is like um, and dealing with everything from the environmental pieces of it to your standard sort of HR and you know how to fundraise and things of that nature. Um, after a, a little bit of work there, that was a that was a short term job uh, while I was looking for other things, but made some great connections. Uh, I worked for, as Dan said, the Department of the Interior uh, solely on natural resource damages. And so, for folks who aren't familiar with that, think um, you know the BP, the Deepwater Horizon oil spill, um, or the Exxon Valdez spill after oil spills or uh, significant releases of hazardous substances, the government can go to responsible parties and say, hey, you have to make us whole again for the public's natural resources that were destroyed. Um, so it's a really niche sort of esoteric part of environmental law. And that was all I did um, all over the United States. So it was really interesting um, and you know, to be involved on case by case levels, but also in the sort of setting of policy for things like restoration banking or mitigation. Uh, and then we uh, decided after a couple of years that it was time to move back to Seattle to be closer to family and um, found a great job uh, with some former colleagues from my previous firm who work now for Nossaman. Nossaman's a medium-sized uh, firm that does a variety of work, but environmental is one of our top two or three biggest practice groups. Uh, so small office in Seattle, there's only eight attorneys, but we're about 120 attorneys nationwide. And I get to do, as, as Dan said, a mix of litigation and transactional work. So, um, you know, today is a good example. I spent part of the day trying to help a client who's cleaning up their property and the second half of the day doing federal wildlife due diligence for a couple of wind farms. So um, I love that. And that's, you know, I think it's one of the things that drew me to EVST was the ability to do a lot of different things. Um, and it certainly, you know, was something that I came out of uh, with a stronger skill set and the ability to, to marry my science background with policy with now uh, law as well. 
So, Dan, does that kind of answer your question? That's, I, that's terrific, Brian. Thank okay. you so much. That really filled in a lot of the, the blanks on that here. Really interesting. Anna, do you want to address that, that same question about um, how you're a little bit about your career after graduating from EBST and if there was anything from EBST that was part of that uh, preparation or transaction, transition? Yeah, definitely. And can you hear me? I tried to switch. I can hear you just fine now. So thank you, Anna. You're coming Good. through just fine. Okay, let me know. Um, so actually, before I graduated from EBSD, I started working with MNR Strategic Services, which is a public affairs firm in Missoula, based in DC, um, and was working with fellow EBSDers, um, doing communications work and really grassroots organizing. Um, so I, when I was working with MNR, I was, uh, the main client was National Environmental Trust, and then they merged with now Pew Environment Group. And so I did a lot of climate change work, um, worked with different constituency groups in Montana, and I focused on outreach to the faith community. So worked with over 120 different kind of faith leaders and, um, and pastors across the state of Montana to focus our efforts on pushing then Senator Baucus um, to take action and move forward some climate issues. Um, also worked on 1872 mining law reform, um, did a fun project where we did a national contest to rename Glacier National Park because the glaciers were melting due to climate change and that was in 2005, <laughs> um, which is a little, sad. Um, and also did some work with Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Minnesota. Um, so did some kind of foundation work on public health and smoke-free communities, trying to work with different coalitions across the state of Minnesota. So worked with MNR. Um, and then my now husband, then boyfriend, moved down to Durango when we did the long distance thing. So uh, he works for a conservation organization as well. So I moved down to Durango and started working with Alaska Wilderness League remotely. So from Durango, Colorado, which is far from Alaska, worked on Alaska issues for my home. So I've been working remotely for about 12 years. So if you have questions on how to do that, let me know. Um, you will grow to love it, I think. Um, so worked on Alaska issues, worked, I was the director of the Alaska Coalition, so worked with 2,000 different organizations and businesses to push forward Alaska issues, primarily the Tongass National Forest and the Arctic Refuge. Um, a little bit of um, National Petroleum Reserve issues as well. Um, and then I kind of switched and I started working for an outdoor industry communications agency for about six years. I was their director of finance, human uh, resources and operations. So I learned kind of more about the private sector, how businesses run, how to run businesses, how budgets work, um, how to hire and fire, how to do kind of business sides of things, um, which was eye opening, but it was also in the outdoor industry, which is very similar to the conservation field. So worked a lot with the outdoor industry, you know, retailer show, went to that often, tried to poke my head where I could in some conservation efforts with the Conservation Alliance. Um, and then I started my own company. So about three and a half years ago, started conservation communications. I work a lot with uh, national nonprofits who, so kind of some of the bigger conservation organizations, mostly on communications events and really organizing, trying to get different groups of people to come together um, with a shared voice on certain issues. I'm working a lot on the Arctic Refuge right now. Um, and then I also am a part-time executive director of an organization called the Mountain Pact. Um, and we work with local elected officials in 80 mountain communities across the West. And I can talk about more about that later. Thank you, Anna. That's a, uh, I'll, mm -hmm. I'll comment in a moment here in a second, but let's let, let's let Tracy address this question now too. There are so many years between today and when I left EBST, I can take up the whole <laughs> rest of the time. I will try not to. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. Um, and to answer the back part of your question first, um, uh, environmental studies is, I couldn't have done the career that I did had I not come to UM and done environmental studies. It's like, it's inconceivable to me to separate them um, and really I know it sounds really cheesy, but it gave me the foundation I needed um, to come do this work. <clears throat> so, uh, you know, it's Missoula, it's Montana. I wanted to stay here. 
Um, and so you put things together by hook or by crook. Um, so I freelanced for a bit. And then at my first real job uh, was the halftime director of Five Valleys Land Trust that at the time had $6,000 in the bank and a couple boxes of cardboard files. And they said, okay, we'll pay you $1,000 a month and for six months. And if at the end of six months, there's still money in the bank, you're still hired. Um, which I thought that is so EBST. I, and I jumped right in and said, of course I'll do that. Uh, and promptly sent um, fundraising appeals to every single one of my professors saying, this is what you taught me to do. Please send money. Um, <laughs> And learned a ton on the fly there and um, launched the campaign to buy Mount Jumbo and now live on Mount Jumbo. And I'm so deeply, deeply grateful for um, the communities um, rallying around early efforts like that. Um, I, uh, I left the trust to follow my husband off to a year long fellowship in California. And then we came back and again, by hook or by crook, um, did a, quite a bit of freelancing and um, and then became, uh, stepped off the board of the Clarkport Coalition to become its director and had so much fun um, working uh, with and for those fine people. Briny was down the hall from us. We were above Sushihana um, and we were scrappy and um, thought and dreamt big because EBST taught us to do that. Um, and uh, did a bunch of work, but the, as Dan was saying, the sort of biggest thing I think that we're, that sort of era of the Clark Court Coalition was known for was our campaign to remove Milltown Dam and to restore the confluence of the Blackfoot and Clark Fork Rivers and to restore the Clark Fork um, and that whole super fun site um, all the way up to Butte. And it was um, heady and remarkable and fun uh, work that taught me a lot. Um, and like Anna said, like I, you know, I, I wish I had taken finance uh, for students on the call. I wish I had taken some business classes and finance classes while I was a student because I made it up as I went along and had to figure out what a balance sheet was in front of board members. You know, I faked my way through it and I got there, um, but I wish I had had a little bit more of that um, background. Um, after the um, Milltown Dam effort, uh, um, a farmer we all know and love called John Tester was elected for the first time to the United States Senate in November of 2006. And uh, they called and said, hey, the Senator wants to bring people together from both sides of the aisle from Montana, like you guys did around the dam. Um, would you come work for him? And I, it, you know, it, it, it was not part of my plan to go into politics and, and public service. But when a startup, a startup office calls you, says, hey, you want to come join the US Senate, um, and they call you at the end of your fundraising year, and you find out it's illegal for you to raise money if you work for a US Senator, the answer becomes, oh my god, yes. Uh, and so I went to work for um, the Senator, and I thought it was so, I mean, 2006 was not that long ago, but it was also a long time ago. Um, and um, uh, uh, conservationists and environmentalists were looked at a little bit differently than they're looked at now. And I thought it was remarkable of the Senator to hire a known environmentalist from Missoula to come do natural resources uh, for him. And um, I learned a ton. I ran his Missoula office. Um, and so in addition to doing natural resources in state for him, did all the things that a Senate office does in state. And, and as I said, every day was show and tell. I'd learn things every day about our community and problem solving, because um, typically people bring problems to senators. Um, and uh, so that was fabulous. Um, and by the end of his first term, um, 2012, I was his acting state director, um, which is a fancy way of saying I drove him all over the state to various events. And, uh, um, and at those events, uh, our then Attorney General, Steve Bullock, um, was uh, at campaign events as well because he was running for governor. Um, and when he was elected, he then called and said, would you be interested in coming to run the Department of Environmental Quality? And much like my reaction when John called, um, I thought, like, are, are, you, are, you kidding? <laughs> are you kidding me? You're, you're, you want a conservationist from Missoula who's a girl? to run your regulatory agency? Like, I thought it was so brave of him to ask. Um, it meant to move to Helena. I was thinking through it and God bless my husband who said, Tracy, the conservation community has been waiting for decades for somebody with your resume 
to be asked to do this job. We have to go. Uh, and he was quite right. And um, I went over to Helena and um, the organization that had been um, in, at some points our adversary, the Department of Environmental Quality, we had sued them. Um, we constantly were advocating um, to them. Uh, I was now in the director's chair of and learned a ton um, about the quality of the people who work every day um, to uphold this really beautiful mission of trying to um, advance uh, clean air and clean water into our future. Um, loved it, did it for two years. At the end of two years, uh, the governor called and said, hey, you wanna come be my chief of staff? Um, answer was of course, yes, uh, because he was uh, um, going to be going through a reelection and, um, and I thought I could help him through that. And also because it would broaden um, my work. Um, uh, I did it for three years through two legislative sessions and his reelection. Um, helped make public lands a pillar of his reelect in 2016. Um, he ran on three things, um, and one of them was public lands, which was, which of, everyone thinks, well, of course, everybody loves public lands. It was huge. Like, it, it, if you look at the history of conservation in Montana, it's typically something that, that even our friends in political office would sort of tiptoe around. Um, uh, um, but to run on it um, and to make it a part of your platform was a seismic shift and uh, that was felt across the West. Um, and we began to watch it play out in other states uh, as we're seeing in, in this very election as we certainly saw in 2018. Um, after f so after five years total in Helena, um, three in the chief of staff's office, which was, um, you know, it's a 24 seven job um, and exhausting and heady and fun, um, but also like literally every waking minute, I was at, in some way thinking about work. So it was time to uh, step down a notch and literally and figuratively come home to Missoula and conservation. And uh, so I came back to Missoula and became the Associate Vice President for Public Lands for National Life Federation, where I am now. Tracy, Brian, and Anna, thank you all so much. I wanted to say two things here. Um, one, I always brag about that environmental studies has the most interesting group of alums on the planet. And I think that's exemplified. You can see that tonight. And second thing, when I talk to students about our program, one of the things we say sometimes is we try to, we try to produce skilled generalists. That is folks who have a really broad orientation and a good set of skills, but who can, who can apply those in a variety of different settings. And the three of you, in terms of your career trajectories, really exemplify that in just extraordinary ways. I also want to just back up for one thing. I was remiss in not introducing my co-facilitator for the evening, and that is Bryony Schwann, who's also on the program here and is doing a lot of work in the environmental studies. And Bryony could e so easily be on this panel as well. She has just an extraordinary, fascinating background. I just want to note that this coming November is going to be the 25th anniversary of one of the organizations that Bryony founded, Women's Voices for the Earth, which came out of her work here in the environmental studies program as a graduate student here. And, and her awareness that um, where were the women's voices in so much of the conservation work, they were just being steamrolled by a lot of the men. And that Women's Voices of the Earth has existed for 25 years since, making incredible work. She also was instrumental in starting the Biomimicry Institute and they, uh, really important work on that. She's been active on the board of Greenpeace. We know Brian talked about working for board of Greenpeace. So I just want to acknowledge I'm really fortunate to have a fantastic partner in Bryony um, who's co-facilitating tonight here. And I, Rodney, I apologize for forgetting to introduce you at the, at the outset on that. No problem, um, Jan. Th thank you. And I'll just say, I'm um, sorry, I'm working around the background trying to figure out if there are other people that are locked out. And so <laughs> I'm, I'm listening and trying to figure that out. So I apologize. Right. Thanks, Bryony. I want to turn to our second question and I'll pose this to Anna first. And that is this, this topic tonight is shaping government and influencing policy. And how do you see that your work, how has it or is it continuing to to shape either either local or regional or national policy. Yeah, thank you. And I, forgive me, I didn't answer the EVST part of the first question. So I'm going to, okay. I should have. Um, I, I will just reiterate what, what all of you have said, but I came um, to EVST with a background in a studio art um, political science and environmental studies and always kind of wanted to do each, but struggled to figure out how I could um, and EVST really helped 
with what you've just described with kind of figuring out a path and how to bring that forward. I remember being like eight thinking I really wanted to make brochures for Greenpeace, um, which also is reassuring that I know knew then what I wanted to do now. But, um, but EVST really was instrumental in showing the path forward and how to communicate with each other. So there were people in the, you know, the MFA program, people in the law program, people in the science program, but we all interacted with each other. I worked at the peas farm. Um, so I just, I just am so thankful to EVST for kind of showing, showing a way that it was possible to bring those things together and it, and it is possible to kind of figure out what you want to do. Um, so I should have addressed that first and foremost, so forgive me. Um, but as far as local and national policy, um, in thinking about this and in thinking about being an eight year old <laughs> and what I wanted to do, um, I have always really focused on how to kind of push people in power, maybe not when I was eight, but my mom might argue with that. But um, so I've, I've done that through kind of the same ways throughout my years. One um, has been just grassroots and grass tops organizing. So getting different groups of people together who are not your typical quote unquote environmentalists who will come together to have a shared voice to move some sort of action forward. So with the faith leaders in Montana, a bunch of top chefs um, to talk about wild salmon, outdoor industry leaders and businesses to talk about the Arctic refuge. Um, so that's one thing I've focused on is bringing together these people who a lot of people wouldn't necessarily think care about a certain issue to try to lift those voices up to push decision makers if that's Congress, administration, or corporate, um, corporate entities. Um, and then I, so right now, one kind of prime example is working with the Mountain Pact. So we work with about 80 different local elected officials in about 80 different mountain communities. So work with Missoula, I live in Durango, Colorado, work with Aspen, Telluride, Alta, um, across all 11 lower 48 Western states. And we work primarily on public lands issues. Um, and so we come together in a variety of different ways. One is by educating each other on the different topics. We focus primarily on federal policy, but they have conversations with each other about local issues. Um, so kind of the education piece and then coming together with a shared voice and then sharing that voice through media. So if that's through telepress calls or media releases, uh, um, a lot of op-eds, um, getting kind of their voices out to a broader range of people and then also doing DC lobby visits, um, now doing virtual lobby visits, which are actually one thing that Zoom is helpful for is being able to bring a lot more people together who have very, very busy schedules who aren't always able to take three or four days out of their schedule to go to DC, but we can have conversations with senators over Zoom. Um, so I'm appreciative of that for, from COVID. Um, so I think there's lots of different ways. Um, and one thing that I, that I try to do again is bring large groups of different voices together to kind of amplify those voices and then um, share that with, with local elected officials or, or corporate voices. Uh, I just did a letter on the Arctic Refuge with 260 different organizations. So representing 300, 30, excuse me, 30 million voices or members um, that was addressed to Big Oil, um, just got a response from Chevron. So, so those, it's fun to see kind of what happens with the collective voice and, and people have to respond to that. Um, so that's where I've found kind of how to shape national policy. Um, and then I also work locally. I, I'm on a few different boards of directors locally. I work on our local elected or our local electric co-op. Um, so I think locally getting, you know, people in power at, at all levels of government is really important. I could go on and on, but I'll stop. Anna, that's, thank you so much for that. I'm gonna I'll turn to Tracy next. And Tracy, you have had such an interesting trajectory from being a strong activist while you were in the program there to meeting uh, nonprofit folks who worked to, to influence government policy on a lot of levels there to then being in the bowels of government itself there and there and now being back in the, in the nonprofit sector. But how, how would you address this question about so you're seeing your work shaping local, regional, or national policy. 
Yeah, I'll give a couple stories. And first I'll say, Anna, oh my God, when I was eight, I think I wanted to be a ballerina. Like, that is impressive. <laughs> I, think I, actually, I think I actually got kicked out of my ballet class. So That's that terrible. Been... Right? I still wanted to be one. So that probably knocked me down a peg. But... Um, so I watched, uh, I watched um, getting, referring actually a little bit to what Anna just talked about, um, the power of people's voices is something to behold. It is real. It is not just something we do to check boxes to say we got X number of people to call their senators or it is real. And I didn't quite understand how real it was until I was working in um, public officials offices because they would always ask, what are people saying on the phones? What, what, what's happening? Like, what are people talking about? Um, first time I, a uh, couple quick examples. The first time I saw the real power of that was um, in the Milltown Dam uh, removal campaign. The Superfund process is super, super, super um, slow. And uh, it, it asks for public comment, in my opinion, way too late in the process. After the agencies have already sort of decided what they're gonna do, take their political brave stand. So we created our own public uh, comment period. And before, um, this is how old I am, before uh, email, um, we got 10,000 people to write to the EPA to say, we want you to take that dam out, um, which was, you know, sort of at the time, an incredible amount uh, coming out of Montana to the, to the EPA's Montana office. Um, and the, the, what, what that meant was the people working on that project and the, um, the head of the office, the decision maker, um, a guy at the time named John Wardell, he understood that if he stepped out on that limb, he was supported by Montana. And the, the elected leaders understood that if, uh, if they didn't throw a fit, right, if they didn't try to, if they just let it happen, they too would be supported. And even better, if they supported it, they would be supported. So under a Republican governor and a Republican president, uh, we got a dam removal. Um, and it was, there's no doubt in my mind, it was because of the, literally the power of the people um, raising their voices collectively. Um, it was a really cool thing to be a part of. Um, I saw it again most recently um, in, my, uh, in my current job. Um, the Great American Outdoors Act passed the United States Senate. At the time, it, it, like six bills had passed the Senate in the entire two years of this congressional session. And one of them was permanently funding the Land and Water Conservation Fund and spending $1.9 billion a year for five years um, to restore our parks and other public lands. Uh, I mean, epically huge win, in part, again, because of people's voices, and this is important on both sides of the aisle. It became such a hot topic that, um, that uh, Republic, uh, Republican senators, sorry about this, um, Republican senators staked their uh, political reelects on it. Senator Daines and Senator Gardner are saying, I'm the good guy, I did this. Um, and that, to me, is what winning looks like when your issues become something that both sides of the aisle want to work on. Um, that is what winning looks like. And the only reason it, it, it um, became a winning issue is because people demanded it, um, both in the voting booth and, um, and through raising their voices uh, around, please support this bill over, you know, I've just truncated a decade's worth of work. Um, but it led to, to this incredible moment this year in this horribly toxic political environment. We got a giant once in a generation piece of legislation passed, super cool. Um, and uh, last, I would, a, a little story I would, that reminded me how important it is that people who um, work in conservation step into public service. Um, when I was the governor's chief of staff, I had a conservationist sitting in my office and, um, and he said something like, oh my gosh, thanks so much for seeing me. I was like, well, of course. And he said, no, Tracy, you don't understand. We don't just get to meet with every chief of staff in a Western governor's office. And I thought, well, that's ridiculous because my, my secret was if anybody asked for a meeting, they got it. I mean, I didn't say no to anybody. Um, but the, but, but the, the point was they didn't feel welcome in, um, in uh, governor's offices uh, all around the West, even, even though friends were there. Um, and what made them feel welcome was me, was my background and, and, and my resume. Um, and that background and that resume 
um, I think helped shape really good decision making in issues that weren't even about conservation. Um, that because I'd done so much advocacy, um, I think I served and helped um, the people that I worked with and for. So I know it's so ugly, um, especially now, my God, it's so ugly. It is literally toxic and making us sick. Um, but politics and public service are really, really valuable and really important. And so if you have the tiniest um, inkling of, of wanting to, to do that, I urge you to explore it. Tracy, thanks so much. Uh, Brian, you've got a really interesting path too that eventually led you to law school and doing the work that you're doing right now. But how would you address this question about shaping policy? I think it's interesting. I want to take just a couple of things I heard from Tracy and Anna and kind of weave them back together here. And the first is sort of the synthesis between local connections and, and national, you know, local policy, national policy, how and how I think in some ways work that starts at the local level over time and with enough people becomes, you know, a, a player on the national scene. And a, a great example of that, I think, is the Blackfoot Challenge. Um, you know, when I was in school, I, I was saying at the beginning, when Vicki got me, you know, right in, a month in, you know, hey, you should work with these folks. You know, there was no swan reintroduction effort at the time. We were still in, hey, what could we possibly do? And it was a sort of ground level introduction to here's how you do sort of neighbor to neighbor, you know, community by community conservation. And um, no joke, two weeks ago, I was on a national... And our uh, natural resource damages uh, conference call with, uh, I don't even know, 100 people. And Lynn Scarlett, now at uh, Nature Conservancy, former uh, assistant, assistant deputy secretary, deputy secretary for interior, was talking about the Blackfoot Challenge as an example of community-based conservation. And I was losing my mind because I just was like, oh my gosh, I remember like being back at a, you know, an early point in that. And so, you know, to me, that's a perfect example of how policy has to start, I shouldn't say has to start locally, how policy can start locally and move into something that's, you know, that's more national. Uh, the other piece is getting experience on both sides of the policy uh, coin. And so, you know, when I was with National Fish and Wildlife Foundation, we were constantly, you know, asking for money, constantly trying to encourage the government to do particular things in the conservation field. Um, now, as a private attorney, I have clients for whom we are advocating for policy changes, be that, you know, Bald and Golden Eagle Protection Act, Migratory Birds, Endangered Species Act, Renewables, Natural Resource Damages, so all sorts of different things. When I contrast that with my time in Interior, where, granted, scale, very different, you know, a, a very specific issue that you could go very deep on, rather than, I think, what I do now, which is much more broad, um, it's interesting to see, to be at the other side of the table, to be working for government. And, and as Tracy was saying, you know, when people come to you and want you to be, you know, making changes, um, you know, I was at, a, was at a much lower level in government, but you still get to see that experience of a constituency coming to you. And the example I'll, I'll talk about is the, the restoration banking community, I mentioned this earlier, came to Interior and said, hey, you know, we have this great thing that could help you. Um, you know, if we could just kind of get the wheels of government to accept that it has an option. Right now, you know, your, your case teams, your field biologists don't see banking as a potential way to meet some of their requirements under the various, uh, various laws that they work under. And, you know, if there was a guidance document that you could you know, explain, hey, this is okay. Here's how you can do it. Here's how it meets the, the various requirements, statutory requirements that would help. And, you know, we got a, a, got to see that be put out and, you know, change things on the ground. Now, next administration knocks it off, you get rid of it, you have to kind of start at square one. But um, I think that those, those are the kind of the two experiences I wanted to tag on to what Anna and Tracy had talked about, because I think it's important to remember uh, one, that small things can turn into big things, and two, that you sometimes have to be creative about how, who you are talking to and why, because there's a lot of different ways to get to your end goal. And that's something that, you know, as right now as a practicing attorney, we're always trying to think about who do we go talk to to get the policy changes that we want. Or, you know, even with Greenpeace, there's who is your audience? Sometimes it's the people 
um, you know, as, as Tracy was saying, with it's the governor's office or it's the person with the, the lever on the power. But sometimes, as Anna said, it's about getting the community together and, you know, raising enough awareness and discussion around an issue that the politicians don't have a choice other than to pay attention to it. Thanks so much, Brian. And actually, thanks all three of you. We've, um, we have uh, one more question I'm going to pose, and then we'll open it up for discussion with the whole group here. But we want to take advantage of this moment that we are less than three weeks away now um, from a very important election here. And in fact, um, probably one of the most important elections of our lifetime. And so I'd like to know what your thoughts are about potential impacts to the environment. Um, you can answer in the context of presidential, state, national, local, whatever you'd like to do, but how do you see um, this election, particularly facing that intersection of environmental social justice issues? And Tracy, I'll start with you on, on that question. If I have to say um, ever in my lifetime uh, that there's never been a more important election again, I don't even, I can't even imagine what that moment would look like because I can't imagine an election being more important than this one. It is, um, it is full on, nationally, it is full on watershed. Um, uh, I, uh, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, everybody in this call, I think probably um, feels the same way. That, um, we, have, we have a very shrinking window on a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis, and we cannot, literally cannot afford four more years of um, malfeasance um, and corruption. We just can't. Great. Uh, Brian, Brian, you want to follow that up? Yeah, I, I can only speak really anymore to the national piece of it. I can speak to local things here in Seattle, but not, you know, Having, uh, having been gone from Missoula for far too long, um, I can really only speak to the, the national piece of it, but I completely agree with Tracy. Um, I, I sort of look at the national potential impact in, in three ways. There is a, there is a need for, for action, there is a need for reaction, and there is a need for sort of a restoration of public trust. Um, the, the action is clearly, we need to address the climate crisis. We're not doing that. Um, I, biodiversity crisis is also a good thing. You know, it doesn't get as much um, press potentially nationally as, as does climate change, but it is equally important. Um, the reactionary piece, you know, from, and, and again, I'm speaking for myself personally, you know, you, you see a lot of what this administration has done that we need to take back and change. And so, you know, the, the challenge with this is not only going to be, all right, some things that have been sitting with zero action need to move forward. There are a lot of things that have moved forward that need to be pulled back to where they should be. And then I think the third piece, you know, I, I think a lot about our, our, you know, public servants at local, state, national levels, who's the livelihood and the, the work that they have dedicated themselves towards is sullied by an incredibly toxic and increasingly, you know, over dramatic process. Um, you know, I worked in government. I understand that to do that means you are taking, you know, you, it is, it is a sacrifice. You know, Tracy talked about a sacrifice of time. It can also be a sacrifice of money. It can be a sacrifice of where you have to live. Um, and I think it's important to, one of the reasons that the uh, election is important is to help sort of center us again and normalize that it is it is it is service to your state country city to serve in a public role and that there's a responsibility there to take care of not just one you know one slice of the electorate that you're in charge of but in the the full you know folks of who you're, you're, you're uh, supporting and elected for. So um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a very interesting couple of weeks. I am hoping very strongly that we get a change because I think for the environment's perspective, we, we can't, uh, we can't continue down the road. Thanks, Brian. Anna, you're there in Colorado and like, uh, like us in Montana, you have a very important Senate race going on, but there's also other uh, ones there. How would you address this issue? 
I would just reiterate what both Tracy and Brian have said. I mean, this is crucial. We all know that. I think in addition to the climate crisis, I think it's really important for us in the environmental field to think of and remember environmental justice is social justice and social and racial justice is environmental justice and make sure that we're amplifying and working to amplify voices that um, perhaps don't have the stage that we've had the stage on for a long time. So I think, um, again, what both Tracy and, and Brian have said, but I think this election is also critically important for racial issues, um, gender issues, I mean, everything. We all know <laughs> no, it's important, important for everything. But I think in the context of the environmental work we do, I think it's crucial that we make those connections and, and amplif amplify voices that um, that need to be amplified who haven't necessarily been heard as loud as ours. Thank you, Anna. And Brian, in just a moment, I'm going to address the same question to you to get your perspective on that, but I'm going to momentarily violate my role as facilitator and step out for one moment of advocacy here. And that is uh, particularly for all the students we have on here, I really want to encourage you to not ignore the down ballot races. It's very easy to get focused on the presidential race or some of the high profile races. And it's not that they're not important, but frankly, for those of us here in Montana, we're going to have less influence on the presidential race than you might in other places there. But Montana has two senators, which is the same as California, the same as Texas, the same as Florida. We have two senators who can make a huge difference there. We have a very important Senate race here. And we have our state races here, whether it's for Attorney General, Public Service Commission, or you know, the Secretary of State, we've got those folks serve on the land board and they're really critical issues. So I would say, you know, do your homework about the down ballot races as well. We will, we, I think we're extremely fortunate in the Missoula area, in our, in our city and regional government. Uh, currently the city council, the president city council is a graduate of the environmental studies program. Uh, we have three county commissioners in Missoula. Two of them are graduates of the environmental studies program. So there are people who are doing service work at lots of different levels there. And, uh, and just uh, uh, pay attention to all those levels of government because they all make a huge impact in terms of the issues we care about. But Brian, I'm gonna ask you to put you on the spot a little bit just to address this same question here about how you view this. And Brian, you have a particularly interesting, I think, perspective because you grew up outside the United States, but then have been here in the United States for many, many years. And so you've got an international perspective, but also deeply rooted locally and nationally here. <laughs> well, thanks, Dan. You are putting me on the spot because I've been thinking about things like that damn event bright and the glitch <laughs> me and all those kinds of things and not really on the big issues. But um, I, to be honest with you, just sort of what Tracy said in the beginning and everyone else has said, I just, I cannot think of a more important election than what we're facing right now. It feels like an inflection point. And I grew up in Zimbabwe and lived through a civil war and, um, you know, had a leader come in that everyone felt with Robert Mugabe felt everyone was pretty hopeful and we pretty soon had a dictator on our hands and, um, and then the consequences from that were just all the terrible things that have happened to Zimbabwe subsequently um, from uh, ethnic cleansing to uh, you know, mass murders to 50%, a country that used to feed itself to now 50% dependent on foreign aid. And the list could go on and on and on. And frankly, I've been sitting here watching the parallels of what I saw happen in Zimbabwe. And I am seeing that happen in this country. And in fact, I, I used to always just to wonder, you know, how also did the, did the Nazis get into power? How did Hitler get away with what he got away with? I, it just was in, unfathomable to me. And now I feel like I'm watching it happen in this country. Um, you know, I remember when Trump got elected, everyone said, well, let's not worry too much because we have all these checks and balances. But those checks and balances have uh, not actually been in place uh, or they've been undercut. And frankly, I'm pretty, I'm feeling quite hopeful right now. I hope the polls are right. I hope that we're not going to be any for surprises, but I am feeling hopeful that Biden is going to win. Um, obviously, it depends on a free and fair election, and that's a, 
hugely at issue at this moment in time. Um, but I think it's critical that we get out and we talk to people that we know who don't, who sit on the fence, who don't usually vote and get them to vote. And also just, I wanted to say, you know, the down races, um, some of you might've seen over the weekend that the Missoulian endorsed Monica Trinnell for the public service committee, or didn't endorse her, endorsed her opponent, who is a right wing, complete nut job, has incited all kinds of white supremacist organizations to come to Montana. And um, that's an incredibly important race because the Public Service Commission, which most people know nothing about, is really in charge of so many um, energy issues and pipeline safety and et cetera in the state of Montana. And um, fortunately, a lot of people spoke up over the weekend and called the Missoulian and wrote to them and wrote all over their Facebook page and they did an about face. Uh, and that to me is a hopeful sign that there are threads of democracy left here. Um, but that's a race that you, th for those of you who may be new to Montana to really acquaint yourself with, it's an important down ballot race that often gets left blank. So even when you have a, gov a Democratic governor who might win and other Democratic um, candidates high on the ticket, it drop, what happens, it drops off. People don't know those races and they don't vote. So really, really important race. Thank you, Brian. And sorry to put you on the spot. Tracy, did you want to add something to that? I couldn't agree more on the down ballot races. Could not agree more. It's, um, it's not only good governing, it's a bench. Um, it's also a backstop. Um, governor Bullock vetoed more bills than any governor in history. Um, and he did so because the legislature is two thirds uh, Republican. And there were some um, pretty extreme things that came out of that body. Um, and you know, the checks and balances work, he vetoed them. Um, uh, and so it, uh, it's just, it is super important um, from top to bottom. This election is super important. And it's, this is one of those cases where literally every vote counts. The, almost every one of those races is in a statistical dead heat right now. So they're going to come down to just a few votes. And so I get everybody you know to make sure they're registered and get them to vote. I, I'm really, really critical on that. Um, we have some time now for some discussion and some questions here. So I want to just open it up for uh, folks who are in the audience. Uh, you got a chance to address some questions to three extraordinary folks there or other people listening in. And what, what, what else would you like to, to talk about? And feel free to just unmute yourself and, and ask your question. I think we're small enough now we can see everybody. Hey, Dan, I, I have a question. And I, I, I'm actually not going to turn my video on because uh, Lo and behold, I'm actually in my pajamas. I haven't left the house all day today, but um, you're, you're in a trout stream. Right? <laughs> yeah, right? <laughs> um, um, and this question is actually for Tracy, but but anyone, I guess, uh, who who might have insight into this question. Um, you know, a couple weeks ago, I sat in on the uh, roundtable of the Crown Continent Conference um, and listened to Patrick Holmes speak about Bullock's um, climate at a, uh, climate resilience plan and policy and his his. I guess, Climate Council, Climate Solutions Council. Um, and I guess, you know, what's so great about our, 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 our government is that we can vote in, you know, new elect electives every four years or two years or six years. Um, the downside is that unfortunately we get maybe some like Gianforte as our governor, which looks like is, is, is what's going to happen. So I guess my question is how, how, how do we make sure that everything that Bullock has been working on and doing so important to climate adapt, um, resilience and adaptation. How do we how do we keep moving that forward with, with someone like Gianforte coming into office who could potentially, you know, we know his, his voting record on public land and, and his views on climate change is, uh, is less than superb. Yeah, it's going to be um, it's going to be difficult. Um, uh, it's not a foregone conclusion. Um, there are still a bunch of independents who are undecided and the independents who are decided have are breaking for Cooney. So um, it's not a foregone conclusion, um, but, uh, but it is an uphill battle. Um, and to answer your question, uh, I, I served on the Governor's Climate Solutions Council and he intentionally brought together people who were, had very divergent views um, with the hopes that some of the recommendations could hold across administrations as a result of those divergent views. Um, and I think that the I think that the power of uh, the levers here are in two places. 
Um, one is with the companies themselves um, and, um, and the, um, both the utility and, at Northwestern Energy, the owners of Coal Strip, um, um, and then also uh, the PSC. Um, and then the other is with the legislature. We really do have a citizen legislature where every two years people go for 90 days to serve um, and they do listen sometimes, <laughs> not all the time, um, but it, it comes back to the, that the voices really matter. And in this case, the thing that pulls over and over and over again is this notion of our responsibility to future generations. Um, so young people um, raising their voices uh, on behalf of themselves and their, um, and their uh, one day potentially to be kids um, is I think really, really important. I, uh, I, wa I watched, I'm, I'm telling stories out of school here. Um, uh, Moms Clean Air Force did an event um, with the governor on climate change and brought in all these tinies, I mean little tinies, like short people. And they all sat and they looked up at the governor and they were on it about climate and it made him like nervous. <laughs> like, he loves kids and he didn't want to disappoint them. Um, and at the time I thought, oh my God, I don't know about this. And, and, and then in, right in, as soon as the event kicked off, I thought, no, no, this is perfect. This audience is perfect. Um, so uh, the power of young voices um, is really, really important, I think. Thank you, Tracy. There's a question in the chat room from Andrew Slade, and I think it is it's posed to Montana, but I think it's true across the West, frankly, across our country. He says, I'm curious to hear panelists take on the changing politics uh, here in Montana across the West, especially city versus rural, east versus west. When I was in EBST, it was Pat Williams in the West and Conrad Burns in the East um, there. But I think this is a dynamic we're seeing, frankly, across the country on uh, the urban versus rural uh, kinds of issues. And how, how do you see that manifesting where you are and what, how, do you, how do you address that? And, Tracy, I know, I mean, I want to get all the voices in here, but I know that was something that you worked really hard on in uh, particularly in the Clark Fork Coalition because you were working in areas with a lot of rural people who didn't necessarily share the same political uh, convictions, but you were able to find common ground and ways to work on these issues there. But it seems so much more polarized today. And I, I notice that even when I take students on field trips now, how more difficult it is sometimes to, to bridge these barriers. But any thoughts from our panelists on this? I think there's no doubt that um, our politics in Montana are nationalizing. We used to split tickets all the time, for example, and that's becoming less so. Um, but coming back to the Upper Clark Fork and what we learned there, um, it's super easy to vilify your opponent um, if you don't know them. But if you, um, if you relentlessly ask to, <laughs> to, to engage, um, like the, the day that the Upper Clark Fork Watershed Restoration Coalition, which is the rancher group, invited us to their meeting. I was like, this is bigger than a banner headline in the Missoulian. It's giant. Um, and that, that just that one-on-one -on -one talking uh, is so, so important because then you can cut down to real shared values and you can also just be honest about what you disagree with. Um, Dwayne Ankney, when he um, got to know me as a legislator in Coal Strip, um, uh, uh, and, you know, I dealt with him a lot when I was at Department of Environmental Quality because of coal. Um, and he confessed that once I moved over to the governor's office, he said, when I first met you, I thought you were the devil herself. Um, but what powered through that was talking about really where, where the, the shared values are. And our shared values were around taking care of the community of Coal Strip. And so the, the it's a, sorry, a long-winded way of saying um, talk to people. Yeah. And I want to ask you too because I know your work with Mountain Pact you do this quite a bit with with small towns and cities around the west who are confronting these dynamics as well. Yeah I uh, Tracy I agree very much with you it's having a conversation um, it's I think it's also a matter of just asking people um, we were we're just now with Mountain Pact working on a Hilt kind of this idea about some funding for gateway communities and and I just asked some I mean I did Facebook searches and Google searches to kind of feel out who I was reaching out to um, 
and they wanted to sign on. They were, and I was shocked, <laughs> but excited. And then you start the conversation. And I think sometimes there, it's so divisive um, that it's hard to break through, especially now. Um, and I think we're still gonna definitely have that. Our congressional race here is with Lowen Bobert, who um, is a QAnon person. Um, and there are some people we're not going to get past. Um, I was in a, just to go back to the question, I was once in an elevator with Conrad Burns, and forgive me, I'm going to swear, but he, I, he said, oh, what are you doing? Um, <clears throat> and I was there at a lobby, and I said, oh, I'm working on Alaska, you know, issues. And he said, you goddamn environmentalists. So we're not going to win over the Conrad Burns or the Lauren Boberts of the world. Uh, but I think finding common ground, asking people about their families, you know, asking them about their grandchildren, being friendly <laughs> and nice and um, just having conversations with people really still makes a big difference um, and, and finding that common ground. Uh, and that same Conrad Burns um, supported the oil and gas withdrawal on the Rocky Mountain front because ranchers on the front sat down and talked with him about it. Um, it really is just a matter of people talking to people. It's as old as the hills. And as our senior Senator John, uh, John Tester so aptly says, use your ears first and your mouth second. <laughs> That's a great line. Ryan, has this dynamic showed up in some of the work that you're doing with the environmental law now? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I think about all the way back to like the big timber trip that Tom Roy took us out on to meet with state senators out in big timber and just sitting down at a table with someone who, you know, not only did I go to college in Boston, but I live in Missoula and you just like, so already kind of at a loggerhead there, um, but to, you know, and certain topics, you know, that individual and I are never going to agree on wolves. We're just not going to, you know, that's, but can we come to a better understanding of where we're both coming from and a mutual respect? Definitely. Um, my concern is that as we become more polarized and more, you know, you, you hear people talk about the echo chambers or the silos of, you know, conversation, that we lose that opportunity to talk to people who don't have the exact same experiences as us. You, you, don't have that opportunity to have the conversations that both Tracy and Anna appropriately so identify as important. Um, but, you know, for the last 14 years, you know, since I left Missoula, I've been in that opportunity or in that situation of you're the big city person, be it, you know, when I, so when I did Community Salmon Fund, it was a small scale grant program for the National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We went to every county in Washington state and worked on salmon habitat projects that were county based. So you're meeting somebody who works for the water resource agency or the local, you know, a conservation district and it was just their project, but I'm always coming from Seattle, you know, so there's that dynamic that you have to deal with of in the same way that I, you know, I'm going to go in with my own preconceptions about what folks are going to believe or be interested in, they're going to have a similar impression of me. Um, same thing happens when you're when you are a Washington DC lawyer going out to middle of nowhere Texas or middle of nowhere you know Missouri to talk to folks about you know the the critters that you're going to help restore in their backyard there's also that element of it too right um, and, and Anna I don't know if you've had this experience with the Alaska work but I've definitely you know seen a lot of uh, the hackles can be raised if you're coming in from outside to dictate to someone else how you think things in their backyard should be dealt with. And I mean, that's something we saw at Greenpeace a lot as well. You know, how do you, how do we sh have the shared resource? How do we have the shared earth uh, that we're trying to, to, to keep safe? So I went on the topic there, but yeah, go ahead, Anna. And I just, on the Alaska piece, and I think in all of these uh, things, all of these location-based projects that we work on, it's so critically important to have to work with the people who are most greatly impacted, right? Or the people who live there. So for Arctic Refuge work, we're, you know, we work with Gwich'in and we support the work that the Gwich'in Steering Committee is doing. And um, 
because that's who's going to be most greatly impacted, not me in Durango. Um, I care about the place, but I'm much further away. So I think lifting up the local voices of people who are directly impacted um, is critical in those sorts of situations. Thank you, everybody. I want to call on uh, Zoe Greenberg, who's one of our current environmental studies graduate students. And Zoe has a question about journalism. Hi, can you guys hear me okay? Yes. Yeah, okay, great. Um, yeah, this is really exciting. I'm really happy to hear all of your different stories. Um, and I guess it's just gotten me thinking, and Anna, this is a great segue because I write about things going on in Alaska and I don't live there. Um, and I, so I've been thinking a lot about how to tell stories from a writing perspective. And some of us are in the environmental writing track or are, you know, dipping into journalism while we're here. And so I guess I'm just curious to hear um, your thoughts on the role of journalism and freelance writing and some of the work you've done. And also if you have any advice for writers that are coming into the world out of graduate school where it is pretty toxic and there's lots of ways to tell stories poorly. Um, so I guess I'm curious on how you view writers in, in all of this that you've discussed tonight. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, Stories are so critical to all of what we do, right? It's how we connect with people both locally, but also from Alaska or from afar or, you know, in Texas, Brian, or <laughs> Boston. Um, and I think, you know, interviewing and getting enough perspective and sharing enough perspective that you are giving a holistic view is important. Um, and I think, um, being creative, I, I can't, uh, uh, freelance writers, right, especially right out of graduate school or elsewhere, I mean, that's a, it's hard to break in, right? <laughs> I mean, I think one of the, the critical and one of the pieces of EVSC that I have found the most helpful is the network, right? Dan, you said a thousand, I think grad students and 600 or 800 undergrads. Um, being willing to just call people and have conversations. I've talked to uh, quite a few EVST folks who are, you know, trying to figure out what's next, what they could possibly do, doing internships, which as crappy as that is, <laughs> sometimes is a good foot in the door, taking some of those jobs that might not be exactly the best, you know, to get your foot in the door. But I think reaching out to to other people and just staying connected, one with the group of EVSTers you're with now, um, with the professors. I mean, I think we're all such a, I love EVST because of, I, I mean, I interact with different EVSTers constantly. They're either at foundations or in local government or writers. So I think being open to have conversations with people and just ask questions and, and offer to help. Um, I, didn't, I don't feel like it really answered your question, but I hope that was kind of helpful. Dan, can I add something to that? Uh, sure, go please. Go ahead, Ryan. Ryan. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think, Zoe, that Anna hit it right on the head that one of the things you should do is talk to other people in the area. Like, I'm not really going to be in a position to help you necessarily, but like, there are so many EBST alums. It's just like, that's a, well, you know, you should talk to Matt Frank, you should talk to John Sen, like, you know, Dan and Brini and, and Vicky and everybody can point you to people who are doing that type of work um, who are going to be able to share the experience. Um, I know it's my science training that that has me think like this is not I'm not the first person to try something right. Somebody's tried it. Somebody's experienced things that even if it's a slightly different situation, I'm going to be able to take something from that and, you know, use that tool. So um, definitely lean on the folks who are who are out there doing this work because they'll be able to if it, if at the very least identify pitfalls to look out for. Thank you. I have a question here from um, one of our newest undergraduate students, Quinn Seibert. And Quinn and I are studying nature and society together this fall here. And Quinn, do you want to pose your question to the panel? Yeah, thanks, Dan. Um, so I've seen a common theme um, in environmental change that it starts on a local level and it gradually uh, becomes uh, international. and it, it seems it's it's uh, pretty clear through like our panelists' uh, careers that you guys started local and 
uh, worked up to a, a bigger uh, playing field. So I was wondering as a UM EV EVST undergraduate, what, what can I do now to help build my resume and um, like make local connections? I, I know you guys, uh, Brian, you just talked about uh, like talking and um, making, trying to make those uh, kind of connections with Vicky, but is there any other advice that you guys uh, may have? Intern. <laughs> Uh, um, Brian just talked about John Sen. I was like, oh, John Sen, he interned at the Clark Fork Coalition. Um, I mean, I'm, here I am working at the National Wildlife Federation and I interned there as an undergraduate in DC because I was getting a radio TV film degree at University of Maryland. And um, life is one big circle and here I am back, back in the saddle. Um, you just, I think internships provide um, uh, the opportunity for just learning a ton. Um, they're hard, right? They don't, they either don't pay or they pay squat, um, but they do, uh, they do pay off um, in dividends if you can live off of a credit card for a little bit. The don't other thing, Quinn, I think I would add is that you, you know, use your network that you're developing now. Be aware that the people that you're in school with now are going to be people who you are, you know, colleagues with in the future. Um, I'm gonna give John Sen a bit of grief because he was on this earlier and he dropped off right before we started talking about him. But you know, there's an example of somebody who I, you know, was in EVSC with and you know now is at EPA, and like you know, you you will be able to call on the people that you're getting to know right now as they also proceed on their environmental paths to help guide you or advise you. So um, you know, I think clearly what Tracy's saying. Is, is spot on, but also consider that as you as you progress, you're also going to have your your fellows uh, in arm right now who are going to be able to help. And I would just say too, it's it's really hard during COVID, um, certainly to network and meet people. Goodness, um, but I locally have been working on the local green drinks, and I don't know if Missoula has that, but we work. We have two organizations every month kind of host and we come together as kind of the Durango sustainability community. So I would also, um, especially if you want to stay in Missoula and stay connected to Missoula when we can, um, go out and go to, I mean, the Clark Fork Christmas party is key. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like that's where you have to meet everybody and you have fun and you, you get to um, connect with people who you might not connect with in other ways. Um, and they are likely EVS tiers in some way or married to an EVS tier. So I'll just jump in quickly too and say that um, when I was at Women's Voices for the Earth, most of the staff that I ended up hiring were from EVSD. And they came in, most of them came in either as volunteers or interns. And, um, you know, that was a great way for me to be able to see who was fantastic and who was um who was worth hiring and so i if you want to go to a particular organization or work for a particular candidate volunteer or if, if you if you can't get an internship volunteer get your foot in the door that's the most important thing that you can do i'll just follow that up with i ended up spending five years working um on human rights issues in central america and that's Anna and I spent time working in Guatemala and stuff like that. That whole thing started when I just volunteered five hours a week for a local organization that was doing the work that I wanted to do. They didn't have any way to hire me, but I said, I don't care. I really want to, I want to contribute to what you're doing. And then a year later, they hired me to direct their Latin American programs. And so you can build those connections. I oftentimes talk to, when I'm talking to prospective students, I say, you know, you look at the Environmental Studies website and we can show you all the formal things that we have in our program. But one of the biggest assets you'll get from our program is going to be your fellow students. You'll be part of an amazing cohort of people who care as passionately as you do about these issues, who are going to go on to do extraordinary things. And you will be friends and colleagues for life on that. And so I really echo what, what Tracy and Brian and Anna have said about that. Um, build those relationships now and then maintain them uh, because they will, they will serve you really well with whatever you do uh, beyond that point here. I think we have time for one more question, and I posted one that Devin had put uh, to the uh, the box here. Devin, do you want to just read your question or reformulate it for the panel? 
Yeah, sorry, it's a little wordy in that one. Um, but uh, going back to this idea that like consensus can come from, or like there seems to be a consensus in the group that like bipartisanship um, can come from having conversations with people um, and finding that common ground. Uh, so how do you think that this method of creating bipartisanship can relate to having conversations about climate change? So I think I probably have the least artful thing to say, so I'm gonna jump first. Just, <laughs> um, I think it's a great question, Devin, and I think it's all about trying to listen. I mean, it's back to what Tracy was saying, Senator Tester's, you know, use your ears first. Um, when I think about, you know, sitting at a dinner table in, you know, somewhere in the Blackfoot, you know, talking about swans, it was mostly about listening to where the people were coming from first and trying to find the thing that I could connect with. And sometimes it was growing up in a small town. Sometimes it was like, you know, being raised Catholic. Sometimes it was, you know, sports, you know, whatever it is. I saw other friends who, you know, were, so if we, if we talk specifically about climate change, you know, I would think you can go with faith backgrounds. You can go with access to public lands. Um, I'm not a hunter, but I have many friends who are, and that's something that they use as, uh, a bridge to begin a conversation. So I think it's about identifying, you know, listening first to hear what the other person is telling you and taking from that, where are the commonalities that we can draw on? It doesn't mean it's gonna be easy, but I, that's where, that's how I do. Yeah, um, it's not easy and it does start with listening. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we're all overachievers and we want to jump to the solution. Um, and instead of, instead of hearing about shared concerns, um, most people see it and they'll acknowledge it, right? They'll, 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 you're talking to a farmer, you say, when did your grandpa plant? And the farmer will tell you, oh gosh, different than when I do, right? And so uh, there's just ways to get into the conversation. Um, that have to do with uh, the inevitability of it. And so therefore, what are we gonna do in the face of the inevi inevitability? Um, and I think that leaves room for a lot of conversation. Um, and I think coming now, we have this spectacular opportunity that arises so rarely in history um, with the climate crisis and an economic crisis, um, given COVID and, the, and so many people out of work and an oil and gas glut uh, around the world and the oil market tanking and um, that we can, if we're smart, we can frame um, the necessary and needed climate change all as jobs and economy. Um, that we're just turning the corner to the future and that means um, putting families to work. And uh, so, yeah, it, it, it's, it's really hard because it's so fear-based. Like, it's just, it's so based in fear, like God wouldn't do this to us. Um, this can't be happening. Well, it, and it's really scary. Um, so it's, uh, the, I'm not being very artful, um, getting out of the he said, she said, and into the, um, the common fears and also the kicking around the common solutions, um, I think is a, is a path forward to it. And I would just say we've had success, uh, well, not we, but I, in the West, in mountain communities across the West, there has been success. Uh, the inevitability of it, the fires, I mean, dust on snow, the runoff is early, it's impacting tourism, it's impacting, there isn't enough snow for resorts to make enough money. I mean, it's, it's the resiliency piece, like people recognize we need to do something again for the economic reasons um, or else our community is, is gonna be in a really tough spot. And now on top of COVID, extra rough. Um, so I think people are having those conversations. And again, it's been, you know, a wildfire. I just, we had a fire two years ago and there have been a lot more conversations locally about resiliency and how do we, you know, adaptation and all of that from people who would not have talked about it before the fire was in their backyard. Um, so those real experiences, unfortunately, um, also are spurring action. I, 
And I think that's why uh, on so many issues, working at the local and state level um, makes sense because, you know, mayors are pragmatists. They have a city to run. And when there's snow at the wrong time and runoff at the wrong time and big, huge storms, um, uh, like, and they, they're the ones dealing with it. And right, you know, right above that, governors are the ones dealing with deploying the National Guard and, um, and having whole fields be wiped out by floods. And um, they can, it, it's a little harder to get all, um, uh, to use sort of rhetorical, um, for lack of a better word, nonsense, when people are suffering. You gotta figure out how to fix people being suffering. Um, so, uh, that then rises up to um, the national level. I saw it happen in, in the health field in Medicaid expansion. Like states are going broke because people are uninsured and rural communities are shutting down because hospitals are shutting down. You get right past your um, Obamacare nonsense when you want to keep the hospital in Shoto open uh, and you vote for Medicaid expansion, right? And, and that's all about story coming back to the, the question about journalism, Zoe, it's about story and keeping that hospital open. Um, so we just, sorry, I just took a big tangent, but it's the same, right? It's, the, it's about mm -hmm. people and their lives. I, mean, I might add one other thing too, to this really helpful thing. And Devin, I'm glad you posed the question. And that this is one of the things that in my experience too, is why it's so valuable to keep building your network and to build your network also with people who, sh who have diverse perspectives from you necessarily. But there may be times when you wanna talk about climate change where you're not the right person, but you may know someone who is. So I think about Zach Brown, who's one of our undergraduate alums, and he served three terms in the, in the Montana State House, and he really wanted his, his Eastern Montana colleagues to be able to talk about climate change, but he knew they weren't gonna hear it from him. But he brought in somebody from the National Farmers Union who had been working on climate change, who was a farmer, worked in the same constituent, same organizations that these legislatures represent, and he had them talk about it. And they, that, degree, that created a degree of openness that simply would not have been possible for him to talk about it. I think the same thing, you know, I teach a class called the greening of religion. I have quite a few students in there who are not faith-based themselves, but you can learn. You can learn the language, you can learn the issues that are important, and you can also learn who in those communities can address those issues so that if, you, if you've got somebody who's approaching it from a religious or faith-based perspective, how do you, you know, find the way to make theirs? So I think that it goes back to, again, what I think what Tracy was saying, that the advice from John Tester, part about listening first is also respecting where your per the other person is coming from and what are their concerns and what are their issues and that means really knowing their, their context and issues and then figuring out what's the way to be able to speak to them and it's part of it's by listening but part of it also may be by getting people who are going to have that rapport and trust to start with on that as well so um let's see uh dan can i make a plea Yes. I, I just want to point out that uh, environmental studies has a jobs listserv and almost all the jobs in it are sent to me by alums who want very much to hire um, the new crop of <laughs> environmental studies students. So I want to thank the alums who have sent me jobs, encourage people to continue doing that. And when the current students become alums, please do send us those jobs that you see, I've had alums send me jobs and say, this job is not right for me, but I think it would be so good for another environmental studies student. So I wanted to send it uh, so that it would be in Enviro Jobs Listserv so that my fellow alums and students who will soon be graduating will see it. So that's part of the networking and it has been very helpful to people to get jobs and also very helpful to the organizations that have been able to hire our excellent students. Thank you, Vicki. And I, we're, we're at the, near the end of our time here, and I, there's a couple other questions that are in the board, but I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm going to instead just pose to our panelists and just say, do you, any of you have a, just a final word you'd like to, to say as we, as we move towards concluding here? Yes. Um, don't forget to go outside and don't forget to laugh. I mean, the best jobs that I've had, I've laughed every day with my colleagues. Um, and it, it, it sounds uh, corny, but it really, really matters. Anna or Brian, you want to follow up anything? Vote. <laughs> kind of obvious, but I'm going to take it, Brian. <laughs> <laughs>
think, I um, think one other thing, I always say that and then I have something else. I just, again, would reiterate, don't, um, don't shy away from reaching out to people or connecting with, you know, Dan and others and asking to connect with us or other people. And again, as, as Brian said, we can perhaps connect you with other people. I mean, that's kind of what makes this group so special to me, um, among many other things, but just we really want to help each other out and uh, EVSD folks have helped me out. Absolutely. So just don't hesitate to reach out. I will add, uh, in addition to, to vote and to going outside, to taking care of yourself, uh, enjoy your time in EVSD while you are there. It is a very short period of time. And I think I vividly remember driving west on I-90 out of Missoula in July of 2006, thinking that was really fast. And that was 14 years ago. And that just it blows my mind. So. Um, enjoy the time, Take, do as much as you can. There's not gonna be another time where you're gonna be able to get a student pass at Snowball. I don't know if that's still a thing, but you have no idea how much it costs to get a regular pass at a ski resort. Like, it's ridiculous. Um, but just enjoy the people, because it's a great place and a lot of wonderful folks. And, uh, you know, thanks to Dan and, and Bryony for setting this up. It was great to see Tracy and Anna again. It's great to see Vicki and some of the other folks. I saw Robin and, and John Stein came in the chat for a bit. Um, but thanks for having us. I want to thank Tracy, Brian, and Anna, uh, especially for this and for Brian for setting this up. It's I think one of the really fun things about being the director now of the Environmental Studies Program is I have a lot more interaction with our alums, and I never fail to leave feeling really uplifted and exhilarated because of the extraordinary people we have doing extraordinary work. So thank you so much for everybody here. I will just want to assure Tracy, Brian, and Anna, um, we have another extraordinary cohort, both our undergrads and our undergraduates. We continue to get the best people in the university. They give me hope every day for what we're doing here. And uh, you all model where they're gonna be going, but they all uh, really are doing the most important work here now as well. So thank you everybody. Have a good rest of your evening. Do be safe. And uh, we'll be posting this on the website at some point too for people who didn't get a chance to listen in, but I'm really glad we had a chance to record it. So good night everybody and thank you again. Good care. Bye. Bye. Thank you.